Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us today on a, uh, another installment of Inspiring Heroes. And I have another inspiring hero. This, uh, this is Steve Cunningham. Uh, uh, we, we have been friends for a, uh, for a short while, uh, in part because we're neighbors. And it's sort of like, wait, you work in animation? I work in animation too, hey! And immediately we became family. <laughs> Um, and so just to give you some qualifications on Steve, Steve is absolutely amazing when, when you consider that, uh, that, that Steve is a professional boxer, IBF cruiserweight champion between the years of 2007 and, and 2000. Wait, wait, is this the same guy? Wait, are, are you six foot three? Uh, no, I, but no, no. Are you the uh, other Steve Cunningham? I think you've got my cousin. <laughs> well, the, uh, uh, this Steve Cunningham has had a, a, a really a storied career, um, uh, started out in, uh, training in, uh, in Canada and has been working at uh, some of these major studios, worked at uh, Fox with uh, Don Bluth, then ended up working uh, at DreamWorks, did a while working over at Disney Features Animation and is currently working at uh, Disney Television Animation. Um, uh, Steve is, uh, he trains uh, artists, uh, other animators in how to be uh, animators, worked in both uh, 2D animation and CG animation, uh, and uh, all around just a fantastic person, fantastic mentor, somebody that you certainly wanna, that you wanna get to know in, in the industry. Um, and, uh, but when I, when I started putting this talk together, these talks aren't, I, I don't want to make these talks about, uh, superstars, uh, talking only about those things that, that we're familiar with. I want to get to some of the intangibles. Um, so for, uh, for Steve, I wanted to get to something, which is, I, I think it's crucial and it's essential. Steve has always managed to find work, starting out from the beginning of his career to now, he's always managed to find work. Studios always are looking for him uh, to, uh, to come in and help out, help out on their projects. He's the guy that can pick up the phone and immediately find a job somewhere else because he's built those kinds of relationships. This is imperative. If you're going to work in animation, you have to be able to uh, create a network of people that understand who you are and that uh, and that trust you, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about these these intangible elements. What what about because we always talk about the art side of it, but what about your person, uh, your professional self? Because that is something that you have to work on. It's you don't uh, an, animation isn't just about your artwork, but it's also how well you work with others, and uh, and so this talk is going to be about your professional self. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, welcome. And uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about this incredible journey that started out in Canada. Well, yeah, I'll give you the cliff notes. So I first got introduced to animation in high school, really. My art teacher, who I became friendly with, um, had a box of cells in his back room. I don't know how he got them. Uh, some studio had gone under and donated them to the school. So I, you know, there's an arm on one layer and a mouth. And, and I, I kind of had a, you know, just a very thin layer of understanding about what animation was. But I, I took these and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then I put it away for a little while. And then I was working in a warehouse and didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. So my, it was my stepdad, actually, who, who was an artist when he was younger and, and said, hey, you were interested in animation. Why don't you uh, call around? and and See what's out there and i was lucky enough to be growing up in vancouver canada at that time this is the, the late 80s and so i you know lucky in the sense that it was a big city with studios because not every city has studios certainly not back then and so i called them all on the telephone you know went through the yellow pages and the white pages and called them all on the telephone said, hey I, you know i'm interested in doing what you do can i get a tour can i talk to someone and they all said no they don't do that you know except for one a place called studio b um, Chris Bartleman was the guy I talked to. They were a small operation. It was just him and Blair Peters at the time. And Chris said, yeah, come on down. Bring some of your drawings. So I brought my drawings down on my bicycle, drove downtown, rode downtown on my bicycle at lunch break. And he looked at them. And he says, yeah, 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 these are terrible. But he told me about Sheridan College. And so I, I sort of did some, some research into Sheridan College and contacted the school, and they were great. And, you know, every morning before I go to work, I get up at like 5 in the morning, work on a portfolio. I'd never... I mean, what, like drawing my sneakers and drawing the room perspective and stuff like that. And I got, I got really lucky. 
in the sense that I got accepted um, at a time that if I had applied the year later, I wouldn't have because Be I think it was Beauty and the Beast had come out uh, right before I applied. And so they got inundated with, with applications. So I got really lucky and I think I just barely scraped in. And then from there, I just looked at the talent around me and, and was overwhelmed. You know, because when you're in high school, you're, you could draw, you're okay. And maybe you're towards the better ones in your class. But when you get to uh, an art school, all these kids are best in their class. And I was overwhelmed. So I, I worked really hard, as hard as I could, because I didn't know anything else. I didn't have the talent that the other kids had at the time. So I worked really hard and, and I got lucky. And then uh, in a sense as well, that in my second or third year of college, Lion King came out in 94. So when Lion King came out and did a billion dollars, Fox said, hey, we want to make animation. Warner Brothers said, we want to make animation. And Turner wants to make animation. And Disney was expanding. And all these studios opened, but they all needed people. So I got lucky enough to get onto uh, Fox Animation Studios in Arizona and started working on Anastasia. Um, and a small film, Titan, um, Bartok the Magnificent and Titan A. And, and then you know, Toy Story had come out in 95. And that was sort of the end of 2D. And um, a studio closed in Arizona, and, and like I said, I got I got lucky. Moved to California. When, at that point. when you worked with uh, Don Bluth, did you uh, get any uh, Don Bluth drawovers? No, because it, you know it's one of these things. Again, timing is, is is such a crazy thing. By the time I got there, Don was sort of removed from the animation, the day to day of the animation, and sort of given it off to the leads. Um, but there was one shot on Titan A, and I had a, I had this idea for the shot. I got to cast the shot, and I thought, oh, I don't want to know if I like this. And I got this idea, and I went to my production supervisor. I said, can I pitch this to Don? And it's so sure. So he arranged it. It was after hours. Everyone had gone home. I had to stay late. I was scared to death. I, I tell you what, I'm so scared to death. It's Don Bluth. And yeah, I pitched well, Yeah, it. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't interact with him on a daily, baby, daily basis. And I was just a junior guy. So I went down to his office and I knocked on the door and it was the right time. Oh, come on in. And he, he was wonderful. And I'd heard stories that he could be really not wonderful if you caught him at the wrong time, but he was great with me. Listen to my idea. And, and say, yeah, that sounds great. Go ahead and do it. And this was really a wonderful interaction, but I didn't interact with him too much. But yeah, no, I, I was, uh, I, that was one of the highlights for me. And, you know, people used to go through the trash and steal his drawings and stuff. He was just, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Don's in a lot of ways. You know, he's just, just such a talent. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing talent. And it's funny because I've got, um, I, I've got a box of my, you know, where I keep a lot of these, uh, the artwork uh, from the different projects. And, uh, and I think I probably have some original Hans Bacher sketches. I know that I've got some uh, Paul Felix sketches. Because uh, when you're working with people, you're, you know, they're drawing over your things or you know, somebody's going to do a replacement drawing of something or you're doing that or there's a half-finished drawing. And these things are just floating around from one person to the other. And then you, yeah. you, you get stuck with them at the end. And, uh, and, you, and they're too precious to throw away. Yeah, it's interesting. We had one of my instructors at college at Sheridan College at the time was a guy named Charlie Bonifacio. He was amazing. Like, you know, they called Glenn Keane the American Charlie B. You know, that's the kind of caliber this guy is. And he was a hero to all of us. He was he was one of the supervising animators on Clouds actually recently. But I have all, all the drawings he went over of mine in college to, to putting a clean sheet. I have all of those still. And oh. every now and then when I pull them out, I think, well, maybe I've gotten to his level by now. No, yeah. you think like, maybe I can catch him. Maybe not, I can not catch a chance, him. not a chance. Every everything is just um, gold, and so I still have all of those drawers. Yeah, but despite despite that, there being these superstars in the industry, yeah. that that these superstars don't make the films. You know, it it's the other, you know, uh, you know, thousand people that are working at the studio that uh, that that do a lot of the heavy or most of the heavy lifting. Uh, uh, everything from animation, in betweens, effects animation, all of you know, uh, uh, you know, clean up, all of these different things that happen in the studio. And so uh, the important, and there's a lot of people that are doing that. And the important thing is that that you are the kind that you become the kind of person that uh, that that people can rely on, that people can trust. And I was thinking about that. Um, so uh, one of the things that you want to do is uh, is build that trust. So, yeah. and that's part of building this, this professional uh, relationship. So it, uh, that involves, um, you know, when you think of what is a personal, uh, what is a professional relationship? And it involves uh, people working together to achieve a common goal. Um, you know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, you know, it's funny. My dad said to me a bunch of years ago that no matter how much technology changes, it's all about relationships. Everything's about relationships. And, I, and you know, when you're younger, you look at that and go, wow, I, you know, that can't be right. 
And as you get older, you realize it's true. So in terms of um, building that sort of reputation, I mean, hey, listen, when you're young, I'm certainly guilty of this. You, you go in like a bull in a china shop and you think these, these guys that have been doing it for a while, they don't know what they're doing and everything. And you make mistakes. And I, you know, I, I made my fair share as well. But after a while, you realize that you want to build these relationships with people, not just on a professional level, but if you like them, you, you like them. You know, hey, you keep in touch and you do good work. And, and you, know, you always want to try and do your best um, no matter what. And sometimes it isn't the best, but sometimes it's your best at that given moment. And you want to build this sort of, uh, people want to work with you because you're friendly, you're personable. Hey, how was your weekend? That kind of stuff, what they call soft skills. Because then it's like when you come up to the person's desk and you say, hey, I've got some drawings for you to look over or whatever. Oh, yeah, I should bring it by. Or even if it's simple as, can you come back in 10 minutes? Yeah, no problem. And you have that sort of interaction because animation is, is not one guy. You said it yourself, you know, not one guy in a corner, unless you're uh, Bill Plimpton or Windsor McKay. And even those guys didn't do it completely on their own. These things are team sports. You know, you're, you've got a thousand of your closest friends pulling this pyramid brick by brick across the sand desert to its final location. Yeah. So the goal is to try and do your very best and be the person that's easy to work with. You don't want to be that person that, oh, geez, so-and-so's coming up. And then you have to brace yourself for the other person. You don't want to try and do that. You want to be yourself. You want to be personal, be friendly, do the best you can and, and be that kind of person that everyone says, oh yeah, I love, love that person. That's yeah. great. You know, they were wonderful. And, and whether the job exists beyond the project or not, you know, I was only at Disney feature for a six month, very short period of time, but you want to try when you're at these places to, to leave as good of an impression as you can so that you get called back when they have work. Yeah. And, and yeah. even if you don't get called back, you know, you make friends, you know, well, I try and I played hockey my whole life and everywhere I've worked, there's always someone that's in a hockey. And I keep in touch with all those people. I worked at a small place called Eisenberg in Pasadena for six weeks. And there's a guy there that we're still friends after a couple of years later, because he's in the hockey. We're, we're just, yeah. you just get along. Do you think that your hockey skills playing in a team helped you to be a better team player? I don't know the hockey skills necessarily particularly. I think that hockey for me is great because it's an introduction to people who also like hockey and you have that in. Oh, who's your favorite team winner? But I think playing on a team sport as a kid and, and learning how to deal with adversity and learning how to maybe not get that promotion that you worked for or how to deal with a teammate that you don't care for that doesn't like you, but you still have to work together. You know, all those sort of experiences, you know, being a good winner, being a good loser or anything associated with, with team sports, I think is helpful. Not necessary in, in all words, because as artists, we tend to be more introverted at times. But I think understanding that we're in this together and, and if someone asks you to do something um, and you don't wanna do it, you recognize that, hey, I don't wanna do this, but it's part of my job as a teammate to do this for the production. You know, When you're an animator, you get cast shots and not every shot you get cast is golden or an A shot or whatever they call it, but they all gotta get done. They all part of the movie. You know, Gary Goldman was famous for saying, there are no small scenes, just small animators. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's about understanding. I think the, 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 for me, playing a team sport comes into understanding that team dynamic. Yeah. And saying, you know, you're working with a supervisor that, that you just don't get along with, but you still have to work with them. They're still your teammate. Yeah. And, and that sometimes it's hard, but you do it. Yeah. You know, and it, it, I, I hope people are really paying attention because it, it's like drinking from a fire hose right now. You said some things that are really powerful. And one, one of the things that you said was it's not about, it's not about, doing the best work um it's doing your best under the circumstances that you're given because anybody you can get a superstar and you tell and you tell that superstar hey i need you to give me uh, I, I need um a character design for an incidental character and i need uh and i need it in a half an hour right yeah. they're going to give you their best within that time limit now if you gave them two weeks right? It make a big difference. They can turn something up. But if they ha only have a half an hour to turn around, it's, it turn it around. It's going to have a particular look. It won't be as refined as what you would expect from somebody. And, uh, and then in, in other cases, you know, uh, we're being asked to do exactly the same. Sometimes the, the, uh, the frame has already been set up where somebody, you know, they, you're working on a character and, and you get to do this small little piece of animation and you get this character that is, that is difficult to animate. 
This is not an easy character to animate. Or uh, sometimes the proportions are too even on the character. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an oversight. By the time it comes to you and you have to animate it, you have to do the best with what you have. It's not a strong design. It's a design that works in three quarter, but does not work in profile. So th these are things that, that uh, people have to understand is that you're not always doing the best work on the project. You're doing your best with the time that you've been given. And that is, I think, where you end up developing that trust that you have with other, uh, uh, other teammates. They look and they say, I know that I can get this, this thing to Steve. A, he's not going to complain. And he's going to, uh, uh, you know, we know that the project or that the design isn't working. But we give it to him and we give him three days to turn this around. He meets a deadline, turns it around, and, uh, and, and, and he's easy to work with and he's yeah. cheerful. Yeah, and that's really the thing, you know, in terms of time management, you mentioned it, it's like, if you give someone the same task, but two different deadlines, you'll get two different results. For me, I try and work, you always want to try and work to the deadline. If I have get cast a shot to animate on Monday, and it's due Friday, first thing I'm going to do is sit down at my desk and say, okay, what needs to happen? And you plan out your week, you know, and that a big part of that, you know, when you're talking about soft skills and, and working in a team environment is, is making sure that the production people on your team know where you're at. So if I have a shot due Friday, I always write into my itinerary, Wednesday, sometime just after lunch, check in with my production, send them an email going, hey, just a quick update, this shot due Friday, this is where I'm at, this is what I plan to do. I'm hoping to do this, this, and this by Thursday, which will allow me to do X and Y by Friday, get it in, I'll, re I'll follow up with you after that, if it goes well, great. <laughs> because they have a job to do as well. You know, they're trying to manage schedules and, and quotas and different things. So part of being that good team, and it's not just artistically, there's a lot of production side stuff as well. You know, when a, I remember I shot on Crudes, the, the apartment manager came to me and I, I was fairly fast as an animator in those days. And she said, we're down for footage this week. I've got this shot. You don't see the character's face. It's just a back shot. Can you do it? And I, yeah, sure. So you think about it. You've got, I got three days to do this shot. The camera move, we move past the character, so it's only really this. And you, you figure it on your head, and you be that good teammate because you want to be um, good with the production as well. You know, they have a job to do, and you're not adversarial with them. Yeah, you work with them, and I think it's really important to work artistically with your supervisors, but also with your production people, and let them know where you're at. Say, hey, listen, it's Tuesday morning. I know the shots due Friday, but I think I'm going to have trouble because of this. This. So you give them a heads up. You don't want to ever come to Friday at five o'clock when the shots due and say, oh, I, I'm not going to get it out. If you can avoid that, you want to try and avoid that because then that throws them off. And being a good teammate to production, I think, is a big part of uh, working in this collaborative environment. Yeah, and like and like you said, it's not just with other artists, but it's also with with the production management that you yeah. you have to have this uh, this really good rapport with them as well. And it's funny because um, uh, as artists, I think there is there is a couple things is that um, I, in order to get really good at something or drawing or painting or animating, you have to spend a lot of time alone. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just you and the pencil or you and your paintbrush. And as a result of that, you don't develop the type of skills that, that you need, these soft skills, these, these people skills that other people are developing. Let's say like uh, when, when we were kids, and then you and I uh, were, were in fourth grade and we're drawing something and they, and and they turn us out to recess. Uh, and what do we do? We're finishing up our drawings. We're like, oh, you know, I've got this drawing and we start drawing and we're sharing drawings we're, and we're having a great time and we're not even talking to each other. We're just sitting next to each other drawing. We're not saying anything. The other kill, kids are out on the playground and they're learning negotiation skills. They're the ones that are saying, hey, you know, uh, it's my turn to go on the swing or it's my turn to go on the slide. Um, and then if the other kid doesn't let them, they go out and they negotiate with teacher's aid or negotiate with a teacher. Hey, you know, Billy doesn't want to let me play or he doesn't want to give me the ball. And so they're constantly in a state of negotiation and they're working that out. But as a result, artists don't develop those skills until later because we, we end up, we, we put so much emphasis on our art that, that this ends up falling, uh, falling away and, and we don't have this. And then you take ar these artists that have spent all this time alone and then you put them in a team environment under yeah. pressure cooker circumstances yeah. and fireworks happen. And, and sometimes artists will, will do and say things that, that aren't appropriate uh, for working in a team environment. 
Yeah, well, I think there's a couple elements to that if I could peel away at it. So for me to be an artist, and my, my opinion, it's not right, it's just my opinion, is that you have to invest yourself in your art to be good. Um, if you just tick the boxes and do all the cliche gestures, rubbing the back of your head, all that stuff, you, you know, it'll be fine, but it's not necessarily good. So you have to invest yourself. When you invest yourself in your work, and you show it to somebody else, and you get uh, critique or feedback, it's hard, especially when you're younger, and it was for me, to separate the criticism of the work from the criticism of the artist. When you put your, yourself into your work, wait a second, you're criticizing me now. So there can be an adversarial relationship there because you're putting yourself in your work and then they're talking about the work. They're not talking about you. They're talking about, oh yeah, can you push this arc? What about this gesture? And it's hard to separate that sometimes, I think. Um, but the other thing that's changed for me is that when I learned animation, it was very much master apprentice. And I learned in the 2D paper pencil days. So working with in the blues group, you is an in-between you do five in-betweens, you'd show it to the assistant. Then you make corrections. And then you you when you became a, uh, an assistant, you work with the animators and so on. So you're always working with people and people will go over your drawings. If I was showing my drawings to John Hill, who was one of my first supervisors and really set me on the right path, he'd, he'd bring me your drawings and put it on the pegs sheet of paper and then talk me through and show it but now with computers and stuff I find that that interaction is less you can have the conversation where you push this do this do that but you're there, there isn't doesn't seem to be the time spent where you sit down at someone else's a junior artist's desk get into their Maya file or whatever software and really show them what you're talking about there's a couple of reasons for that a it's it's sort of a taboo thing you don't touch someone else's um, file there's that, there's another part of it is everyone works differently and everyone always kind of works differently, but on paper pencil, there's only so much different you could do. Um, and, and back then on Anastasia, there were 26 animators, 40 people in the animation department. We had 18 months. You know, I look in your, in your rear view, Marcelo, there's a Spider-Verse poster. I heard there were like 200 animators on that show and, and they did it in 10 months. So not only do you not have that interaction with your supervisors, they don't have time. They're managing big teams. So finding that level, like I, again, feel very lucky in the sense that I got into animation at a time when they still did that. And I learned at the heels of some wonderful people. But I think now it's harder for some of these younger artists to, to find that kind of mentorship. And, and, and that can be really a challenge. You know? So if you're on a show at, at, let's say Sony in Vancouver on a show and you get hired on and you're there for seven months working on whatever show, high caliber work, but at the end of the show, there's nothing to go on to. So you cut you loose. Okay, this is the nature of our business. But as a result of that, it's hard to get that foothold where you can really start growing and improving. And, and you, if you're not careful, you can really sort of reinforce bad habits or not learn the good habits. And I think that's a real danger in our business right now. It's just that that sense of master apprentice, I feel, is getting a little lost. And, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but it's just yeah. what I've been seeing you know, the last couple years. I've been seeing some, uh, uh, I, I don't want to mention the projects, but I've been seeing some, uh, some of the more recent animation. And, and I see a, a lot of rote poses. I yeah. see a lot of performances that feel like they're, they're imitations of performances that I've seen in other animated films, yeah. not performances that, that are unique and that tell me something about that character. When you think of like a, where, you know, uh, you know, the animators of old uh, would, would take characters and develop characters such as like a Cruella de Vil. You know, Cruella de Vil is very different than let's say a, a Shia Khan or a Stromboli. Uh, but, you know, these were different, definite, uh, uh, they're villains, they shared that in common, but they were different kinds of villains. And you could, you could figure out the kind of person they were with, the, with their movements. And then I've been seeing a lot of, a, a lot of similarity in movement, unfortunately. So I, th I think there, there's a point there. And, I, and yeah. another part I was thinking was, and I think it's a little tougher for young people right now, is because we've, we've been in quarantine for, uh, two, for years. two years. And, and I think that, that that relationship is even more stunted as a result of that. Yeah, and, and you know, there's good and bad to that. And in the good sense is with this um, pandemic and with development work from home, animation has flourished. It I mean, certainly has. And, and so there's been a lot of opportunities created for young artists that can get in that, that maybe wouldn't have in different times because, hey, there's so much work out there with streaming services and whatnot and, and video games massive and they do such beautiful work now in these in these games and 
So there's work out there. So these younger artists are able to, to get into the industry, which is wonderful. It's, a, it's the biggest boom I've seen since the mid nineties. Um, but you're right, it's hard because you're not in the room. You're not saying, hey, let's go to lunch and let's answer that shot was really great. Uh, you know, and have that camaraderie that the social aspect where you're building from each other and going by someone's desk going, hey, can you show me how to, how you did that thing? And then applying it to yourself, that, that, that sort of osmosis that happens when you're in a studio environment is, is, is like you said, it's, it's, we haven't had it in two years. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. You had also said something that was really uh, important. I wanted to back up and, and go yeah. back to it. Like I said, you know, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose because there's, there's so much information that, that you're imparting. Yeah. And we were talking about this relationship that we have with, uh, with our peers you know, and, and that in some, in some cases that, that we're stunted uh, in terms of our soft skills, our people skills, because we've invested so much into our artistic skills um, that sometimes we will get along with other artists because they can understand us. Oh, you like to draw too. You like to paint. You like the same things that I like, the same toys that I like. And so there's, the, you like the same shows that I like. So there can be a camaraderie. And then there's a division between them or, or us, let's say, and the management side. And then sometimes it's, it's believed that it's an adversarial relationship. But the more, the more seasoned you, you become, the more um, a mature you become in the industry, the more you realize that it, it really is a very symbiotic relationship. And, they're, and it's crucial to not only communicate with your supervisors, but also to have those skills that uh, in communicating with uh, with management, and I and I break this down to speaking in actionable terms. So uh, this would be your communication with your supervisor, yeah. and uh, you're going to be you're going to finish something. So then you tell them what you're going to finish, yeah. and you tell them when you're going to finish. You know, so I'll, I have that uh, I have that drawing and the character layout completed, uh, but not the shadows or lighting, and uh, and I'll have that completed by Friday. You know, so by speaking in actionable terms, you, you're and, and you have to think about it. You have to like before you talk to your supervisor, before you talk to your uh, your line producer, think about what it is that you're going to say and then make sure that you speak to them in actionable items. And I think yeah. that's a, that's a very important component to uh, to this communication. Yeah, of course. And you also want to be respectful of, of other people's time. So when you're going into a meeting or writing an email or composing something, um, be clear. You don't want to take someone else's time. When you're going in to meet with a director and you're showing them your shot for the first time, you get up and you give your little caveats and your spiel, but you don't take their time. These people have, their time is valuable. So you really want to make sure that the way you take their time is constructive. This is what I was thinking. This is what I was doing. I did this for this reason. And then you let the work speak for itself. Um, but also in terms of relationships, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to say that every relationship is, is great because they're not. Sometimes you're going to run into someone who's who it does have that adversarial relationship. But for the most part, I try and think about it in terms of everyone you're working with wants you to succeed, whether it's the studio owner, the producer, the director, because when you succeed, they succeed. So when you think about it in those terms, it sometimes takes a little bit of the edge off. You're like, they're not trying to make me fail because the more successful I am, the better it is for them and the, and the whole team yeah. in general. And, and you know, we've all worked for people and worked with people. You know, there are people that you, they tell you what to do and you end up being their wrist or their thing. And that's, that's one way of working. There are people that say, hey, what do you think? What do you think? I prefer to work with people than for people. But at the same time, you get both in this industry and you have to be able to thrive in both environments. So I think being respectful of other people's time and energy and, and their process, you know, when you get onto the sort of the supervisor side, you realize that sometimes they're getting information from above that you don't know about. Hey, we need to change this prop from this hand to this hand because later in the sequence or later in the movie, it's revealed that they're left-handed and we need to make sure that continuity, you might not know that. Yeah, but it works so great in the right hand and the shot's approved and what are you doing? It's sort of coming to the understanding that, hey, they're not trying to just make a change for a change sake. This, there's reason and purpose and you say, okay, sure, let me get on that and try and, and, and work it out. I'll let you know how it goes. And again, it's a, it's a learning process for for artists and people just to try and get past that sort of adversarial thing because it is sort of that that feel like you're working for uh, you know the management and all these things and the but you know at the end of the day you're all trying to make a great product nobody intends jeffrey katzenberg said this nobody goes out and intends <laughs> to make a bad movie 
Yeah. So the more successful every component of that movie is, the more chance that movie is going to have to be successful because there's so many opportunities to fail in, in when you're doing these things. Yeah, yeah. And one of the difficulties in animation is that it's a moving target. Uh, and oh, yeah. you know, a lot of people don't understand that it takes at least three years, two and a half years to three years to put a feature out. And, uh, and so what, what you're doing is that, you know, uh, the, the audience is this target that's moving. You know, they, think yeah. about where we were uh, pre-pandemic three years ago. So if you started a movie pre-pandemic, um, it, 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 it has to be strong enough that whatever you worked on pre-pandemic is still going to work even for a, a post-pandemic audience. And so this, this audience is moving and, and you're over on this side and you have to lob this, this, this idea uh, over and, uh, and try to hit the target of this moving audience. And it's a difficult thing to do. So, so there's a, you know, it's just another component that it, it's a difficult task and you certainly don't want to make that more difficult by well, sure. having adversarial relationships. Yeah, and also in things that are outside of your control. I, mean, I think it was Lilo and Stitch and you might know better that there was at the end of that movie, there was a big battle through the downtown of Honolulu. Yeah. Well, then 9-11 happens and they have to rewrite the ending because right. like the studio didn't, you, how do you plan for yeah, that? I, so I you can't release that. that movie. I was the one that did all the drawings for yeah. the sequence, so, that, all the development for the sequence that took place in Honolulu. Yeah. And we were flying the 747 in between the buildings. And it was, it, it, it was not the same. And all of that had to be changed. Yeah, and it comes down to it as a professional artist or someone that's working in the team environment, that you wanna try and make everyone else's job around you easy. So whether it means like if you're an animator and you're working on a shot, making sure all those little details like the feet aren't going through the geometry of the of the layout or that there's no geo crashing throughout the shot because then it makes it easier for the cfx guy and then for the effects guy and then the finaling team and all that so you really there's a lot of details that you can't qualify on a resume or put on your linkedin profile or on your show reel that, that you 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 gain that sort of reputation through working with people oh yeah i asked them to do something and they did it they told me they did it they showed me great so you want to try and when you're working and being a professional, make your job as best you can, but make everyone else's life around you easier. When you communicate with production, you're making their life easier. When you communicate with your supervisor, your director, and clearly express yourself and what you're trying to do. And when they don't agree with you, make a change. Yeah, sure, I'll get on that, no problem. And then follow through. You know, that's huge. So when someone hires you and they've heard that about you or worked with you before, they don't worry that you're creating work for them. Yeah, you know, I, I remember one time we ended up having a lot of trouble on, on a studio. There was a production that just got really crazy. It, it got really messy. And I remember a friend of mine was asking me, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to make sure that I'm not part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's sometimes that that is your sphere of influence yeah. is that that you cannot contribute to the part to that part of the problem. Yeah. And as it turned out, my department was the department that didn't have any drama, everything was working smoothly and ended up holding the, the, the entire project together during that time. Yeah, you, you do the best you can and do the best you can for the people around you because in terms of this is what we're talking about with team sports, you know, um, or you thinking of animation as a team sport, you have teammates and you might make the, you know, if you're an animated shot, maybe you break something in your shot and it looks great in a play blast or in a short movie, but it's gonna show up in lighting or, you know, the more you can try and anticipate those things and be uh, considerate of, people around you that what they have to do with their job so it, it may just be as simple as when you talk to someone and you meet someone in another department say hey you want to grab lunch sometime I, I don't know much about what you do when you're in a studio environment when we get back to that and then you sit down you learn a little bit more about other people what they do you realize that okay if i do this one little thing different in my job it's going to make their life a lot easier and you know all these things come together and and when someone gets your shot at another department go oh this is going to be great easy to you know whether it's 2d in the shots on model or whether it's there's not a lot of issues or minimal issues or even if there is a problem they call you and you fix it you say okay yeah no problem i got it on right away those all those soft skills they matter and and people remember that stuff and again it's hard because you can't qualify that on paper you can't say that in no. your link profile you and, and, and so many stuff. times so many times i'll do like we're going to hire somebody and I find like, okay, what studio were they working at? Wait, yeah. they were working at Nelvana. Uh, does anybody here work at Nelvana? Oh, you did. Did you know this person? Did you work with them? And I want to find out who they are because that's the intangible. Uh, you can open up a portfolio and see, uh, and see what, they, uh, what they can do. You can look at their resume. You can see where they studied. 
but you don't see those intangibles, what we're talking about right now. And, and you have to rely on other people's experiences. What did you, what was it like working with that person? You know, it's interesting. I, I'm reading a book right now because I read a lot of books about animation, but I also read a lot of books about hockey and I like uh, biographies and autobiographies. And this chapter where I'm at right now, it's uh, Brian, book, Brian Burke's book. And he's talking about, he was the GM of the US Olympic team in 2010. And anyway, I won't get too much into the hockey thing, but he was saying that for him, the mandate was bringing the right players, not necessarily the best players. So when you're inviting someone onto your crew, onto your show, you want to make sure they fit with the culture of the team. Because you can have an animator or an artist that is the best at what they do, but difficult to work with. They don't show up on time. They set their own hours, whatever. And you can have someone who might not be as good, but it's a better teammate. And, I'd and rather you want work, that person. I'd rather work with that other person, honestly. Yeah, because yeah, you can work with them. Because so, you're working. Yeah, these, these things. And like I said, a pre, it's a pressure cooker situation. And sometimes you're working in a pressure cooker situation for the full length of the project. Yeah. You know, uh, you can be working three years, three years with with this pressure, uh, yeah. um, uh, you know, situation, and you certainly don't want somebody that's going to contribute to the problems. Yeah. Um, I hear another another aspect is uh, do as you're told, yeah. don't go rogue. And so many times that that you're given uh, you're given a task to do, and sometimes you think that you could improve that, and uh, but you and I like what you did. You had an idea, you took it to Don. You know, as opposed to doing it yourself, like ah, I'm going to do it, and and they're going to appreciate me because I'm going to do it better. Talk about that. Talk about going rogue and, well, and there's a couple the importance things. of not going rogue. I should say. Well, see, when you're as an animator, when you're cast a shot in the assignment, when you have that handout with the director or the supervisor, it's important that you come away from that interaction with a clear understanding of the intention of the shot you're going to animate. Why is the shot in the movie? And you want to satisfy that above everything else. And if you have an idea that's different from what you've been handed out, you have a couple of options. Uh, you can present your idea to the supervisor director, say, I wanna try this. Or you can do a couple of versions, do the one that you've been told to do first and always, because that's what you've been instructed to do, and do another one outside of that, that's, you know, in rough terms, say, this is what I'm thinking. And you can pitch it and say, this is what you've asked to do. This is what I'd like to try. And what do you think? And then, and then the important part about doing that is you go with the decision that's been made. So if they say, no, we like the one that we wanted you to do, great, thank you, I just wanted to try and bring something. Because a lot of great filmmakers wanna include that sort of process. If you can, if you can elevate, um, there were shots that I've seen happen, I think it was an over, over the hedge where an animator had done a shot that was amazing and, and it elevated those characters to a bigger part of the movie because you look at that and go, we didn't expect this. So trying to find those hidden gems are great. You don't wanna rob the filmmakers of that, but you also don't wanna always go off book because you know these films are constructed and with, with intention in mind. So, you know, that's what I would suggest you do. Do what you're told, understand the intention, satisfy the, the intention of the shot. If you have an idea, either pitch it or do it. So, you know, like action speaks, right? So say, this is what I've done that you've asked for. And this, I did this on the side. I think there might be something there and then pitch it and then accept the whatever happens. Because when you're showing your shot for first pass blocking, I find that the most critical point in the, in the process where you've handed out the shot, director says, this is what I want. When you're showing for first pass blocking, that's when it's actually up on its feet. And everyone's in the room, hopefully all the supervisors are there, the director's there, the producer's there. And then there's a conversation that takes place. Does it work, does it not work? What about this, what about that? And when you walk away from that interaction, you have, should have a clear understanding of what needs to happen to get the shot to the final spot. At that moment, you could, you could pitch your idea. What if you did this? What if you did that? What if we tried this? And then there's an opportunity there to be a participant in the process. But after that's over, then it's time to roll up your sleeves and do the work. You you know, if if you want to direct the movie, you have to work your way up to that position. You're not a director, you're an animator Yeah. in this case. So you have an opportunity to, to, to have input, but read the room in the sense of knowing when to say, okay, great, I got it, and then move on. And that's, that takes a long time. It took a long time for me to understand that point to say, hey, this is my idea, I think it's gonna work. They say, no, we like what we have. No problem. Yeah, and and another aspect, which is that if you're being asked to do uh, A, B, and C, yeah, uh, you've you've been given assignments and you've been asked to do A, B, and C, you got to do them in that order. Yeah. Yeah, or if 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 you're not sure, if you think doing C is you can get C done quickly, you could always have that interaction. Again, communication is so important in our business to say, hey, I can knock out C by in an hour. 
and then go to B and A. And, and if they go, okay, that works great. Or they say, no, we really need A first. I know it's gonna take three days, but A is the most important thing. Okay, great. So then you're clear with your communication. You know what to be done. Because sometimes if you do things out of order, you can say, I can do this, this, when I'm doing that, in terms of managing your time. But managing your time and managing other people's time is different. You know, they say, hey, listen, those three hours you spent doing C, we need that A done three hours earlier than you yeah, delivered. Yeah, there's, so, there's other people in the pipeline that need some yeah. of these things done. Yeah, so if you're unclear, have a conversation, a short conversation. Yeah. Hey, can I do this first? No, we need this. Okay, great, I'm on it. And yeah, then go do it. Yeah, because sometimes they say no, because uh, we, we need you to block that out because we're going to be sending that over to effects yeah. and they're going to start working on the effects yeah. at the same time. And you're like, oh, okay, all right. And then my character has to be exactly here. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. So having those clear lines of communication, because not everybody does. So if someone doesn't communicate clearly with you, that's it's still part of your problem. If you say, I need to understand this and say, hey, I don't quite understand it. And you, sh you have a responsibility to not necessarily walk away until you understand. Now, granted, if they're super busy, say, okay, well, I can set up my shot. I can do these other little things and start maybe filming reference, whatever. And I'll come back to this person because I'm a little unsure. But there's still work that you can be done in the meantime. That's yes, and which, which brings up another point. You don't want to, if you don't have clarity, you can't sit on your hands because you're going to miss your deadline. And that's one of the things you cannot do. And this, I've, I've always been, I've always worked very hard to, to, to protect this. I don't fail on a deadline. Yeah. My deadlines are paramount. I never miss a deadline. Yeah, you can always do something, whether it's opening the file, making sure you have all the right assets in the file, setting it up, doing all that stuff. Um, there's always stuff you can do in the meantime, little, little sort of housekeeping things, but yeah, you don't want to miss a deadline and you want to make sure you understand and you want to be respectful of others. And if, if the supervisor is just trying to get a deadline for dailies and they've got five other artists to see and your shot's not due until next week, yeah. when's a good time for me to come back? I really, I want to seek some clarity on this. And they'll tell and then, you, come back after lunch. Okay, great. Yeah. Or, or sometimes they give you an impossible task. You know, they'll tell you, you know, something like, uh, you know, yeah, I, I need you to ink that drawing uh, or I need you to clean up that drawing. Uh, we, we're turning it over in a half an hour. And you're like, well, it's impossible. I, I can't. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's got to get done. And so it's not about, it's not about your best. It's about doing your best with the circumstances you've been giving and never missing a deadline. Yeah, and then and that, that helps you become that person that they can always trust. They say, that person has never failed me. I can always go to that person. They're always going to get that done. And it's so important on, uh, in a team. Yeah, of course. And I, I teach at Animation Mentor. And I always ask my class in the very first class of, of, of students, say, what's the most important skill an animator can have? And they all say, and there's no wrong answers. It's not a trick question. But I, they say, bringing something to life and doing all these things. And for me, it's about making decisions. The ability to make a decision is paramount for us. So if you're given a half an hour to do a task, what decisions do you need to make to get that task done? And that might mean you, okay, you cut corners here, you cut corners here, spend more time in the eyes because that's important. If you have three days to do that task, you say, okay, what decisions do I need to make to get this task done within that time frame? Or what can I do if I'm waiting to talk to my supervisor until after lunch and I have a tight deadline, what can I do in the meantime that's going to help me later? What decisions can I make? Whether it's say shooting some reference or talking to the people that did the shots around you, what they were thinking, looking at the reels, doing your homework, whatever. Um, but yeah, all those decision-making things, everything you do as an animator, as an artist in a production environment, the ability to make a decision, I'm gonna go for coffee now because I'm gonna be busy later. I'm gonna take a short lunch, I'm gonna take a long lunch because whatever, whatever. It's yeah. all those decisions that, that from there, stuff happens without making those. If you just guess, if you just throw stuff against the canvas and see what sticks, it's gonna take you longer to get the job done. Yeah. And I, and I think also that sometimes when we have a circumstance like that, where, you know, you're working on something, you've kind of been given uh, a, a, a very difficult deadline yeah. and, uh, and you're waiting for feedback and you're not getting feedback. And so you, you, you take this, you're disgruntled about it and you take your grievances and you start to just complain. You go from one cube to another cube and you start to complain. Now this, this becomes very toxic. And you know, talk a little bit about the importance of uh, trying to be positive in uh, in yeah. a studio environment. So there's there's a difference between your professional self, yeah, and then your private self. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. In so the, the studio, thing about being, you have a responsibility. Talk a little about that. Yeah. So I think that we, hey, listen, we all get frustrated in the workplace. You know, yeah. there's always things, and I think it's really important to to recognize that in ourselves. And you need to release that tension. 
so how you release that tension is, is important. How you decide to release that tension. If you go in cubicle to cubicle to cubicle saying that so-and-so is driving me nuts and whatever, that's not necessarily productive or a positive environment, but you still need to get those, those emotions out because you don't want them to fester because if they fester long enough, you're gonna explode and that's not good for anybody. So for me, whenever I have an interaction, whether it's good or bad or indifferent, I go for a walk, five minute walk. Let, this, let the notes wash over you. Think about things or not think about things and let them sort of, you know, just take a little break. For me, that works. And I think the key is finding what works for each individual artist. It might not work for someone else. Someone else might say, I'm just gonna go to my desk and do the, do the work. Yeah. But it's important to understand that, that as people, we have emotions and have feelings and you're gonna have them in the workplace or not. And I think it's important to, to understand how to release those tensions for you, whether it's going to work out at lunch, whether it's having a friend that you can actually confide and say, hey, can you have time for a coffee? I just need to, to vent for a bit. And then and that's it. Yeah. Um, but also you want, us, you want to be able to, able to manage that. So when you come back, you have your best self on. You've released that. Say, okay, got that out. I just needed to vent for a little bit. It's okay. It's okay to do that because we're people, we're human after all, you know. But, but learning how to do that in a, in, a, in a constructive way for yourself as an artist is important. And then when you come back and say, oh, I can feel a little better. I've gone, I've gone for a little run. I've gone for a little walk. I've taken a coffee break. I'm, I'm good. And then you can go back to the task at hand with that more uh, positive disposition. With, with a solution. Like if you take the, instead of complaining, you take the time to try and think of a solution or yeah. you talk to a friend that you confide in. And it's yeah. not to complain. But instead, it's to like, uh, this is this is a task that I have. What yeah. do I do? And you can confide in that person. This is sometimes where a mentor comes in yeah. that they can help you navigate through some of these things. So how, you know, it's very important that if you do have a problem at the studio, and this could be yeah. with your assignment, this could be uh, with a personnel problem, uh, uh, that how important it is to also come up with a solution. So yeah. you don't, like you said, this is being respectful of other people's time which is you don't want to show up to a, uh, your animation supervisor or a production manager, a line producer, and come up with, to them with a problem. What right. you want to do is you want to identify a problem and then you want to give them a possible solution. So th this is better than just showing up because then if, if not, yeah. it appears that you're just complaining. Right. So, you know, if you have a shot and you're like, how do I do this? You can ask someone else and go to the supervisor going, I'm thinking I might try it this way, but I'm not sure if that's going to work. And then it's, it's how those kind of collaborations is important ahead of the game. You know, it's it's interesting that talking about differences between hand-drawn animation and CG animation. And the way I, one of the ways I'd like to explain the difference is that in 2D animation, everyone that comes after you is critical. Cleanup artist, effects artist, color, everything else. There's so many things that can go wrong after it leaves your desk. In CG, there's so many things, you have to do a lot of things before it comes to you. Like there's more important coming, whether it's the modeling or the rigging team, or even the way you set up your shot. You know, a lot of decisions are made more in the beginning in CG, I find, than, than in 2D. 2D, you can kind of fuss your way through at times and, and clean it up later. So if you have an obstacle, a problem that you need to solve, say, I think I can do this way. It's okay to have a conversation with someone that, that has more experience than you or someone else that's more knowledgeable technically than you and say, I think this is gonna work, but I, can I run it by you? And having that interaction is good because wasting time is not really a good thing. And managing time is so much more important than say wasting time. So if you say, if your supervisor says, I don't think it's gonna work, what if you try this? Okay, great, and then you try that. That may or may not work, but, but yeah, I'd say wasting time is, is, is a dangerous thing because in terms of being respectful for the production's budget, time, schedule, the kind of project you're working on, all these things factor in to being a, a professional artist. Yeah, and then also when, when you do get help, let's say, when mm -hmm. somebody helps you out or, uh, you're working on a sequence and then someone else, like you, we work on a part of a sequence. Uh, there's something that's really important to preserving your credibility in the industry is never taking credit for no. somebody else's work. And then always giving credit where it's due. Like if somebody came up and they helped you, uh, um, you know, with the registration, you know, that you have an effect that that is going to be done. Don't just let you know whoever it is that you report to believe that you've done this on your own. No. Be sure to give credit because by giving credit, you're you're actually uh, uh, you're you're showing that you're a team player, and uh, and they know that if you if you are sharing this credit, that you're the type of person 
that they can rely on, that they can trust. Yeah, and and the person that helped you might be the next, they might just need someone to just help them out, give them a leg up or whatever, and, and be generous with that kind of stuff. You know, if someone helped you, acknowledge, say thank you. Whether it's uh, just send an email or say, hey, thanks for your help. It, really, it was really great. I, I never thought of doing it that way. It helps so much. Thank you. It's important to recognize the people around you and, and acknowledge that because it is a team sport. We don't do these things alone. And if you get an opportunity, I, I know at certain studios, there have this sort of recognition system. And, and there's always someone that's unsung, but you realize that they're the glue that holds a lot of things together. Tell somebody, tell the supervisor, and don't necessarily wait to be prompted. You know, if, you, if someone's done you a solid consistently, go to their supervisor and say, hey, I just want you to know this person's doing wonderful work and really helping me out. And you're not doing it because you're trying to do this. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do, you know, and acknowledging someone's efforts because, listen, you know, we all work hard. We all invest ourselves. Sometimes it's nice when someone says, thank you, or you did a good job, or you re that really turned out, I, I, you know, and it makes you feel kind of warm inside. Like, yeah. Oh, you, feel, you feel recognized. And, and, and as, again, as artists, it's, it's one of these things that, for the most part, a big chunk of our day is being criticized for the work we create, whether it's, hey, can you tweak this hand? Can you do this? So you're always good. And, and sometimes it's just nice to have someone say, hey, you did good. Yeah. And, so and that goes back to what we were talking about, which is to, to be the kind of artist uh, that other people want to work with or oh, that, yeah. that you yourself want to work with. I want to work with a person like me. Yeah. And, and it comes down to little things as well. Like I, I kind of had this rule when I was at DreamWorks, you know, rule guideline. I don't know what you call it. When someone's joined the team, if they didn't know anybody, you don't eat lunch alone your first day. Yeah. So if you didn't have lunch plans, you're having lunch with me. Yeah. Because, you know, or welcoming someone to the studio or, or going up to me and saying, hey, welcome to the studio. I'm so-and-so. If you have any trouble or have any problems, you want to know where the closest bathroom is or where the best snacks are or whatever. I'll help you out. You know, be that person because, you know, again, this is someone that's joining your team. That, yeah, they're not right. adversary. Right. They're not competition. Joining, they're... joining your team. Yeah. This is going to be somebody that you're going to rely on, and that that's going to rely on you, and you want to build that. Yeah, and you hope that they pay it forward. You know, if you help someone, because here's the thing: nobody gets into this industry on their own. Very few people, either you know someone or someone gives you a break or someone gives you a chance or someone helps you up, introduces you to the right person. You know, so you recognize that, that there have been someone that's done that for you. Like for me, Chris Bartleman told me about Sheridan College. He didn't have to do that. Told me about the school, all these things. And I had these moments all the way along. So when someone's helped you, help someone else pay it forward. You know, we hand this craft. We don't own this art form. We're, 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 taking care of it until the next generation and you're handing it off to them. Be a good shepherd for that and, and, and be a good advocate for that. And when someone joins the industry, they might not work out at your studio or not, but it, you know, welcome them in and make sure yeah. they've got everything they want. Help them succeed. Yeah, and you had, you had mentioned this before because a lot of times in the industry, uh, some, some of the studios will, uh, will adopt this idea that we're family. And it's like, well, wait a minute. No, no, not, not quite, you know, because you sometimes you think about like, a, you know, and there's that joke, right? When family comes over for Thanksgiving, you're like, oh, brother, you, you're inviting people that you don't want in the house. Um, and so sometimes family isn't the right word. Uh, you, you had said something different. Uh, you had a different idea about that. What is that? Team, actually, it's the same thing as the team. I don't like that family analogy because, A, you don't necessarily like everyone in your family. Yeah. <laughs> but but also, I don't want to be laid off by my family. I don't want to be cut bait at the end of the brunch by my family. Yeah, yeah. But I think the, the concept of a team, joining a team, being a teammate works because when you're on a team, you have to deal with like, there are guys on your team or people on your team that you really don't like, but you need to cooperate with them to achieve a team success, a team goal, winning the championship or winning the game or doing whatever. You don't have to, when I used to coach kids hockey, I'd say, listen, guys, you don't have to like each other, but when you walk in this arena, you're teammates and you have to get along and play. When, what you do after you leave this rink, I don't care. But while you're here, you're teammates. And if someone does something to your teammate, you step up for them. So I believe in that sort of mentality. I don't like the family thing just because it feels, well, it, it's fine. It feels when, false to me. Yeah, but it's fine when you're, when you get hired 
and yeah. they're showing you around the studio in the honeymoon phase and they're talking yeah. about you being family but you're right at, at a certain point you get laid off of something yeah. or or you get passed over for a promotion or you know in some in some cases the some of these rotten things happen and uh, and there's something awful when when you feel as though this is somebody th this was family and these yeah. things are happening so I, I think you're you're right to think of it as a team yeah, it's just the way I like to look at it. It just, it's a little more digestible for me to think of it in that way, because, you know, playing team sports, and I was on a teams, on teams where, you know, you're not the most popular guy in the room. That's okay. But when you're playing in the game, everyone on that team is doing their best to help you succeed. Yeah. And so, you know, no one's going to default their position or leave their position to, to see you fail. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying that stuff doesn't happen, but, but philosophically, you know, nobody wants that when you're dealing with, especially in terms of professional sports. There's no room for that. And we're professional artists. And so, yeah, I, I prefer this sort of team concept. You know, you're working with the teammates in CFX or art department or, or character design. How can we help our teammates make, it, make our team better? Yeah. And part of that in this communication that sometimes people have this idea that, that this is a meritocracy, you know, that if you do really great work, uh, people are going to notice you and you're going to get promoted. And, uh, and this, is, this is kind of a false idea. And I, I, I really believe that it's important for people to, to ask for what they want. Because a lot of times, uh, if you've got a supervisor or a manager and you're doing really great as an animator, they don't know that you want to get into directing. They have no idea. Perhaps you've got other goals besides this. But un until you communicate those goals, they have no idea. So I th think it's important to ask for what you want and, and negotiate for that. Yeah, and there are also people that, get promoted because they are that good that don't want the responsibility <laughs> there no there are oh my like, gosh uh, that is so true yeah yeah there are people that hey i love doing what i do i don't want to deal with someone who's got body odor i don't want to deal with someone who can't get into work on time because when you're supervising or managing you're managing people and sometimes you like you kind of deal with those things you're like, I, don't know, I just want to draw or i just want to paint or i just want to yeah. create something yeah. so not everybody that has uh those glenn Keens of the world or james baxter's that are those not all of them want that kind of responsibility. So but I think it is very important to ask, like setting goals for yourself and for the production goal. If you go into a production and say, hey, I really like to try super, supervision. So at the end of this project, I'd like to acquire some skills. Will you help me to your supervisor or to your production supervisor? And they say, yeah, sure, we can help you. Or they'll say no or whatever. But having yeah. that conversation, at least you don't want to leave it on the table and say, I didn't ask or I didn't make it clear. You know, So if you say, hey, I, this is my goal. By the end of this production, eight months, 10 months, a year later, I would like to uh, get better, to put myself in a better position for these things. Would you be willing to help me? And, and most people will, will say yes. Doesn't mean you'll get what you want, but you won't get what you want because you didn't ask for it. Yeah. And then work towards it. And Exactly, and then work towards it. And part of that also is that sometimes, sometimes those opportunities, let's say you want an opportunity, and those opportunities simply are not available to you at the studio that you're working on. And and it's time to leave. It's yeah. it's time to leave the the team and 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 go to a different team. And uh, and this is something that both you and I were, were talking about. And and you know, there's still some thoughts that that uh, we have in this, uh, which is not to leave a production. I'm, I've never left yeah. the production in mid production. I, I've left the studio in between projects, but I've never left a project uh, while it's in production because I understand. You know, I I really. Um, uh, respect and support the team and I always try to make some of these decisions and some of these career moves yeah. uh, in in between those projects but but you said you're you have an opinion that's evolving on this well I used to think that's so so headstrong and never leave a show never leave a show and and there's a couple of things that I, I I'm evolving that lately I think it's because in the last couple of years, animation has exploded and on, on the show I'm working on now, we've had people leave. And I've actually asked the producers who have gotten to know quite well and say, what, is, what does it look like from your perspective? And they would tell me and say, hey, listen, if, you're, if staying in a production is gonna make you unhappy or toxic or whatever, if your commute is three hours a day and you can get a job close to home, or if you have kids or you have family, or if you have other things outside of work and doing this job is gonna make your life un less happy then most producers are like we want you to be a happy person because we're going to be projects in the future that will work together again you know so for me i don't necessarily think it's about leaving a production early or not of course you want to try if you make a commitment you want to honor that commitment as much as you can 
but if, for me, I think it becomes about how you leave a production. If, if, you know, those relationships, building those relationships, if you go to your team and say, Hey, listen, I've got a newborn at home. My wife or husband is having a hard time. I cannot work here. These 12 hour days in a three hour commute, it's killing my family. People understand that you have a life. And so you can, again, what you were saying earlier about bringing solutions. Can I work from home five days a week? Can I come in once a week or whatever? And if they say, no, we really need you here, they say, well, okay, I know someone who'd be a great fit. I'll stay on until they're up to speed. And go. So I think for me, it's about how you manage those relationships rather than that cold and hard rule. Because if someone gets a wonderful opportunity yeah. working for you and they get a, a once in a lifetime opportunity or once in a five years, you don't want to hold them back. Yeah. So if they have this great chance to, to go somewhere else and thrive, for me, uh, and I'm not a producer, but I would you, you want these things because if you leave a production early and you leave on good terms and you're on another show and, and someone else you interact with, that person's on another studio and, they, and someone they interact with, hey, if you ever worked with so-and-so, oh yeah, they're, they're, they're great. You know, as long as you treat them with honesty and respect, solid people, because you want people when they leave your show or leave your production to have a good feeling about you and and listen, sometimes it's ugly and, and that's not good. And But hey, listen, if you're in a, in a bad situation, you have to do what's right for you. But I think for me, like I said, my evolving as you get older, you look at these things going, hey, people change jobs. It happens. Yeah. But how you go, to, if you come in, if you flip the desk, all the papers up and you punch the guy or the person in the face, and you walk out, you might feel great for about 30 seconds until you get arrested. But you're not leaving that on good terms. No, no. And even if you don't, want to leave on good terms you know this industry is so i don't want to say the word incestuous because it sounds not good yeah, but no it, but but it, it, it but everyone move. knows everyone and, yeah. and and word gets around and this is where the importance around. of protecting your professional self because there's there's your your personal self you know and this is your relationship with your yeah. family this is uh, your, your relationship with with personal friends and then there's your professional self and your professional self is where your reputation comes in and, and it's so important to protect that. And you're absolutely right that if you're going to leave, it is so important to communicate some of these things. So yeah. if you told a supervisor, this is these are your goals, that you, you, you wanted to get out of in-between animation, you wanted to be a key animator, and then those opportunities aren't being afforded to you and you can find them somewhere else, communicating these things to, uh, to your boss and saying like, I've got an opportunity, they're offering me a chance to uh, become a, an animator at such and such studio. And if and if the uh, and it could be that your boss thinks highly of you and says, you know what, I, I'm going to do what I can to get you got to give me three months. And in three months, I'm going to see if I can get you that opportunity to be an animator, yeah. or they can tell you, you know what, you should take it because we can't talk, I can't offer you this position, at least for another year, it's just not yeah. in the budget, I can't offer it. And then, yeah. it, but communicating is so important and I, and I think that was a, a key thing that you said right there. So it's not, yeah. it's not whether or not you leave, but it's how you, how you go, but yeah, and I think that you know, I'm not someone who's comfortable saying, "Hey, I've got this other offer. If you match the offer, I'll stay." It's just, it's just some people are good at that. I'm not good at that. I don't believe in sort of holding someone to their feet to the no. fire. Now, people are doing it and they do successful with it. I'm not that person. So there's that aspect of it. There's the aspect of it of being honest, and sometimes you can be honest, and it puts you in a bad way. And you say, okay, maybe next time I'll handle it differently. But I don't think you can really go wrong with being honest. Like, for example, there was a, a person on our show, a fantastic crush, but got the opportunity for her dream job. So hadn't gone to the interview yet, but told our production, hey, I've got an interview coming up for this is my dream job. Now, you could argue the merits of whether or not she should have told her production that she's interviewing for another job. But she was honest the whole way through. And, and she, you can take that with you you know, all these things. So it's important that you, you're comfortable at night when you go to bed, you say, hey, I did my best today. And it may not be the right thing, but you say, then tomorrow I'm going to try and do better at things you, you can correct. But honestly, I don't think you can really ever go wrong with doing that. And also there's an element of fear about leaving a job. When you're at a place for a long time, yeah, it's hard to leave. And, and sometimes it's good to leave and move around. And it, it's not easy, you know, making good yeah. money, you're working on steady projects, but you're still doing crowd shots or but, but I also think there's another thing, which is that you want to be respectful to the people that you're working with. Because mm -hmm. let's say you got an opportunity to go somewhere else to be that animator. You've been doing in-betweens. 
you you communicated that you wanted to, um, uh, or let's say you didn't communicate. You just, yeah. you, this is something that you wanted. Your boss had no idea about this. You got an offer to become an animator, a different studio. And then you give your, you know, you give them the two weeks notice. Hey, guess what? I got my chance to go become an animator at such and such studio. And they're like, why didn't you give us a chance? You know, why? You know, and so it's being respectful also to your production because maybe you don't want to be that person that holds a job over their head. And I'm not saying to do that, but you do want to communicate and give them a yeah. chance that uh, at least hear you out. That if you say, um, I, I, I'm considering taking a job at such and such thing, and, and you know, and they can um, sometimes they can come back to you with an offer, or, or they just say, you know what, I, we can't offer you anything. Congratulations on, yeah. on the new job. And, uh, but, but you've communicated this. Yeah. And, and those are sometimes those are hard conversations to have. And, and, you know, and sometimes you just have to sit with your discomfort and say, hey, listen, I'm going to, I like it here, but I'm not getting it. Like I'm, I'm getting older or I want, like when I got married, I wanted to make sure I was an animator before I got married because I wanted to achieve that level. So whatever the circumstance for you. But yeah, having good, clear lines of communication is important. And, but also if you, if someone reaches out to you for a job and you're not available or can't do it, I always like to say, hey, I know somebody, if you know somebody. Yeah. So that you're helping these recruiters, you know, because I saw a job the other day that I wasn't qualified for, but I know someone that was. So I passed it along because A, you're building a relationship with that recruiter. You contact them and say, hey, I, I, I'm not, I saw your posting for this job. I've handed it off to someone who's well qualified. They're great. This is their contact information. There's, it doesn't cost you anything. It costs yeah. you a couple minutes of your time. And if it works out for them, wonderful. If it doesn't work out for them, you've made a connection. You've made a relationship. You're maintaining a relationship. You don't want to be that person that only reaches out when you need something either. Yeah. And, and this is exactly why uh, all these years working in the industry, mm -hmm. that so many people want to work with you. And you're the kind of person that can go from studio to studio and, and build these relationships. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to go over some of these topics. Is there something else? That when I when I think of um, you know something else that you want to share with the audience, uh, uh, some of these personal experiences, something that that goes unsaid that that you would like to have uh, be said. Well, I guess I guess what I would say is understand who you are as an artist and how you work in a, that sort of team environment. You know, I'm relatively outgoing, but if you're not that person, you don't have to be someone you are not to succeed in this business. You really don't. But you have to sort of try and. Be who you are, be comfortable in your own skin. But you know, things like if someone asks you to lunch, go. Invite them for lunch. Ask how someone how their day was. Don't ask them, how was your day? Oh, and by the way, I need this. Be, be comfortable in your skin, be comfortable with who you are, be a friendly person, be a, you know, show up to work clean. I know that sounds like a funny thing, but it, it, it isn't really, you know, like be presentable, dress appropriately. But but also recognize who you are as an artist and how you fit into this, this uh microcosm of this culture that you're working with and sometimes it's being that person who's quiet in the corner doing their work and coming out to to feed once a day and if that's how you fit perfectly in that ecosystem great so but you want to be who you are and not try and be who you're not but also try and say how do you fit who you are in this ecosystem and how do you be a contributing member to this team i think that's really important yeah, uh, yeah. another question i have for you mm -hmm. is that uh, are you still teaching yeah, I still teach at Animation Mentor. I've been uh, lucky to be there for a long time. It's it's a great thing. I mean, you know, again, I, I believe in paying it forward. Everything I know about animation is not mine. I didn't invent any of it. I, I've had people share them with me. So I, I like to share that with others and to help them along in their journey. And sometimes you you have an impact on somebody and it, it just provides me a great feeling to know that, that someone that you had a small interaction with has success, whether it's because of you or not, you know, that you were part of their journey along their way to success. I like that a lot. All right. Now, if people wanted to reach out to you and contact you, how can they contact you? Oh, I'm, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, I check that regularly. That's probably the best way. Okay, terrific. I'll go ahead yeah. and add that in sure. the, uh, on the video uh, yeah. so that uh, people can have a way to contact you. But like I said, thank you so much. You're an amazing guy. You're, you're so much fun to chat with. You know, we, we always get together and chat yeah. animation and all. And there was one of these things. Like, this is how it started. We had this conversation. We were talking about these uh, this sort of uh, uh, contract that we have with each other when we're on these productions, this relationship that we have as, as uh, team members. And I thought, we need to talk about this. W these yeah. are things other people don't talk about. Yeah. And, and we, need to, we need to share this because I think part of this is 
that a lot of people have just spent, uh, and, and these young artists have spent two years uh, all alone uh, w- during this pandemic, and they haven't had a chance to build some of these skills. Yeah. And when we all come back, and it's going to happen, the world, world is going to come back to normal. When we all come back, it's going to be important for, uh, uh, for these, the, these essential skills that, that we've developed uh, over years of, of learning how to be better teammates, yeah. they're going to be important for everyone uh, to have working in animation. So for that, honestly, I, I, I thank you so much. And I think, uh, like I said, it was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, there's a lot of things to write down for, for everyone, a lot of things to learn. Um, and it's the kind of video I'm sure that, that people can watch over and over again. Well, thanks so much for having me, Marcel. This was a lot of fun. Okay. All right. Thanks. Have a great night. All right. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye.